I am not going to lie. It has been quite the week. So I decided to pull one of my favorite episodes from the archives. It is a brilliant conversation filled with joy and humor and laughter and wisdom that I needed in my life for this week. It's with my dear friend Gretchen, who's a mom of three, who shares such beautiful insights that can be applied both to baby feeding and to life in general. So as you're listening, I implore you to think about where you are putting extra pressure on yourself whether it's in baby feeding or in business or as you seek to help people with baby feeding or in the postpartum period and how can you insert a little bit of Gretchen's can-do attitude into your endeavors Enjoy this beautiful conversation with a beautiful person. When I began breastfeeding, I was blindsided by how difficult it was. I may have thought I was prepared, but having known only a handful of people who had ever breastfed and only seeing it up close from a couple of them, I had a huge learning curve. Since then, I've become a doula, a lactation consultant, and a childbirth educator. I'm your host, Lo Nigrosh, and I welcome you to the Milk Making Minutes, where we explore breastfeeding experiences through the lens of systemic barriers so that you know your breastfeeding struggles are not your fault and your triumphs really are the miracles you feel they are. So my name is Gretchen Oshodipe. I am a mother of three. Naomi is eight, Lydia is six, and Josh is four. We just finished birthday season. So like, all of my yeah. kids are almost exactly two years apart wow. <laughs> within the span of May to March are all of their birthdays. Yeah. And I'm married to my husband, Sam. We've been together for 11 years, been married for 10. Sam is Nigerian. So our last name, Oshodipe, is Yoruba. Okay. You had kids over a period of time and we talked about baby feeding over the years, yeah. but I'm excited to do it in a more formal way here and to hear about your experiences. Before we get into your experience, I would like to know what your exposure was to baby feeding, breastfeeding before you were actually doing it yourself. I don't remember having a great deal of exposure to it. I have a best friend who had a baby our senior year of high school, and she nursed her son, I want to say for two years. Oh, wow. And we were 17, wow. 18. So mm-hmm. I was like, what are you doing? Uh-huh. Are you supposed to be doing it like that? <laughs> it was very <laughs> ignorant. And I feel so bad now. I think we've talked about it possibly, but... She was young too. So it was, I got to see, I got to see her nurse and I got to see, I got to see that. But other than that, probably there was like a huge gap in time between seven, like my senior year of high school and probably ugh, the next person that I think I had exposure to who was nursing was a really good friend of mine. And that was in my twenties. Okay. That was in my twenties, like my mid twenties. But yeah, my mother nursed. She nursed all four of us. So I'm the oldest of four. And she breastfed all four of us. And I knew that was a thing to do and just felt very comfortable with the idea of it. I'm a former classroom teacher and I've kept relationships with a lot of families across the years. And I remember <laughs> breastfeeding one of my kids and talking to a mom and she's like, that's not what they for. And I was like, that's literally what they're for. <laughs> that's literally their point. Right. And I just You're remember old. she was just like, Mm-mm, I want to use them for other things. And I was like, yes, I understand that. But <laughs> like this, this also is a point of utility. <laughs> so I, I, even while it had been a gap, I think probably in between the high school kind of exposure to nursing and then having a historical knowledge of women in my family breastfed or mm-hmm. my mom did. I don't know about 
her mom and stuff like that. But I know my mom did. Mm -hmm. And then I would say my 20s was like not seeing breasts as (laughs) for babies. Mm -hmm. But then as soon as I got pregnant, I just knew that was going to be a part of our story. Okay, Lo here dropping in for just a second. Are you already hearing Gretchen's confidence and wondering how you can gain a little bit of confidence in your life? Well, everybody gains confidence in different ways. But if you're looking for a starting place, I recommend you check out the podcast Meditation Mama. Kelly Smith was a guest on my podcast, and she is the founder of Meditation Mama. She creates all the meditations there. And it's a great place to get grounded, to tune in to that inner voice that knows what you really want in life, and to start a meditation practice. So go ahead and check it out. I'll have it linked in the show notes. I love the story about your best friend having a baby at 17 in high school. Mm -hmm. Did she go back to school after having her baby? She never stopped. Like, she's a professor. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, she's a history professor. And now her kids are, like, grown. At least one of them. (laughs) Yes. And did she pump while at school? Or I I don't know a lot about... I don't know a lot about... She had a lot of family support. And so I don't know a lot about, like, how she negotiated and navigated college. Mm Mm-hmm. But I know she nursed Marcus for a long time. Okay. A long time. Yeah. And I remember her saying, you just don't know when you're going to have another baby. And this is special and this is precious. So not really anxious to 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 transition. Yeah. So I didn't get it then, but I get it now. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. So then you, so you had some exposure, but then there was a big gap because mm-hmm. we just don't see people feeding babies. I feel like that's pretty common unless you just have tons of friends and family members who are breastfeeding all the time. We really don't see it. Especially like at that age, Mm -hmm. like you're young twenties, like you're in college. Right. So unless, yeah, people weren't having, I don't think people have babies as young as much. So you had some knowledge by the time you got pregnant and were now planning your birthing and pregnancy And baby experiences, did you read any books about breastfeeding? Did you take a class? Did you prepare in any way? Or did you just expect that you were going to be able to do it? I took class. (laughs) It's so funny. It's like, I just, in preparation for this, I like, glanced over and looked at my daughter. And I was just like, God, that was eight, nine years ago. You were a grown woman. But I know we did all of the standard hospital-based prenatal care things. I think there was a separate breastfeeding class, but our insurance had, I'm originally from Tennessee, so I delivered my first child in Tennessee, and then we moved to Connecticut, and I delivered my last two up in Connecticut. Mm. And also, I was high risk. I kept having high blood pressure towards the end of my pregnancies, Mm-hmm. And I say uh, that's out of order kind of information. No, that's fine. But yeah. one of the things that was interesting was like when I first, our first pregnancy, Naomi, I had had two miscarriages before Nay. I and did not so, know that. Oh, yeah. Mm. I had two miscarriages before Naomi. And I, and we lived in, we lived in Tennessee and I was working for an organization that was based out of Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. And so they had Tufts healthcare, which is apparently like the black card of insurance cards. <laughs> like mm. we went into the doctor's office. Like, Dang, where did you get this insurance from? And I was no. like, what is that? What does that afford me? They were like, anything you want. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> it was like, you can have all the tests you want, girl. And no, I'm just kidding. But it was like, <laughs> seriously, like I remember the receptionist calling somebody over and like, have you ever seen this before? <laughs> But, and so I just remember there were certain things that came with my journey. There was a nurse on call that I could call and talk to Mm. after the baby was born. There was a lactation clinic that I could go to. And so I don't remember so much the pre, the pre delivery stuff, but I do remember and utilized the post-delivery breastfeeding support okay. hardcore. Okay. okay. Yeah. And did you have any goals set? 
yeah, I was breastfeeding for a year. Okay. <laughs> this was happening. A piece of it was like practical. I said for with my first that I always wanted to have, I wanted to be the kind of mom that mothered my first like they were my second like I Mm -hmm. didn't want to be super like nervous and anxious and I was like people have been birthing babies for eons like this is not maybe not eons but like like, people have been birthing babies for a long time in Mm -hmm. much more dire situations than I'm in Mm -hmm. and I wanted to acknowledge the hardiness of babies and the hardiness of this other little person and to give myself a lot of grace and a lot of space is okay, this is fine. And I wanted my first experience as a mom to be full of that. Mm. And so I was very intentional about that. And then when it came to nursing, I said, if I'm going to live this life of chill, oh my God, I can't believe that's her first baby because she's so chill. Then what does that look like for me? And that looked like me being able to move about pretty freely. Yeah. And untethered and being untethered meant breastfeeding. Yeah. And so I was just like, I need to be able to move around with my breasts and a diaper in my back pocket and a change of clothes in the other and call mm-hmm. it a day. And that's what I did. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have anything that influenced you in thinking that way? Either people you had seen that were like, super nervous about their babies or the opposite people <laughs> yeah. that were super relaxed and you were like yes I want to emulate that uh, or even being married to a Nigerian did that <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> like, like, no I knew I mean, my personality is pretty chill regardless mm-hmm. and so I didn't I really believe that God gives you children gives people children and he knows the child and he knows the parent. And there's like this understanding that like, that I'm good for whatever child I have in spite of me and because of me. And so I was like, okay, this is, I just want to really like rest in that. And then in terms of like nursing, knew I didn't want to do formula because I thought it was expensive. And then I had seen a documentary about breast milk. And I was just fascinated. Mm. And I was just like, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that stood out to me was something about like how they hadn't been doing a lot of research on breast milk until more recently. And they studied cow's milk because it was, I guess, the closest or one Mm -hmm. of the closest and most accessible. And they were saying that the milk of the like mother cows changed based on the sex of the baby cow. Oh, wow. So it was just like, if it was a boy cow, boys cow needed more vitamins, vitamin blah, blah, blah. But if it was girl cows, they lacked a lot of calcium. And so the mother's milk adapted for that. Wow. And I was just like, good God, that's amazing. And then they were saying like, there's things that our bodies do too for our babies. And I was just like, that is just, I was just, I still am amazed by it. It's just one of the coolest things that that I could have been a part of. So I was just like, yeah, I'm down for this. Yeah. But I don't think there's anybody like I like I said my friend who who nursed, I saw her like really appreciate it and enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I I don't think I appreciated it. I didn't appreciate it then as a, a young adult and I definitely I don't think I appreciated it until I was like into nursing. Yeah. My right. own. But yeah. And I think Sam's mom, so my mother-in-law came from Nigeria to stay with us for our second and third baby. And I was at home with my mom predominantly for our first. Mm. And everybody was just pretty supportive. I don't think I had anybody who, there was nobody who wasn't supportive of nursing. Mm. There was nobody who was like, what? You're going to do that? Everybody was like, it wasn't, but it wasn't like an expectation either. It was Mm. just kind of what you're going to do. And then everybody had my back in doing it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. But like I said, formula was so expensive. I was like, heck nah, bruh. Like, I can't. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> you literally can't. Then yeah. I was like, you got to get some filtered water. And I was like, oh no, that seems like, that seems hard. <laughs> Inexpensive. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I would love to know then, we know that birth 
experiences can have an impact on what then happens with milk supply and feeding. So although this is not a birth centered podcast, yeah, I would love to know you have three children. So, yes. you know, you can tell the stories as you see fit and, you know, how you might have thought they impacted your yeah. feeding experiences with your kids. But if you want to give a quick synopsis of your birth experiences and what impact they might have had on that initial breastfeeding and if I have any follow-up questions that I think might be impactful then I'll ask. Quick synopsis is if I had known what a G I was going to be in labor and delivery I would have had 15. (laughs) (laughs) I was just like I feel and if for those of you who are listening it's just what is this who is this Pollyanna the low got on here like I love breastfeeding I love delivering babies I'm telling you what like I do (laughs) And like, I am not a small girl. And so I also loved being pregnant because it was like a reason for me to be bigger. (laughs) I was just like, it's a baby. I Um, loved that too. I felt like (laughs) I didn't have to suck in. I was like- I don't have to lie anymore. (laughs) I was not sucking in my life. Just sticking it Yeah, I actually lost weight on all my pregnancies because I was probably, not probably, I was overweight before. So I had to be more thoughtful about my diet and whatever. So I was like always the smallest I ever was right after I delivered. And it was great. But so Naomi was, like I said, I had, we had two miscarriages before and, and that was like a whole thing because I credit those experiences sucked, obviously a a really difficult time in our marriage. Of course. What what was the timing of those miscarriages? Very early, like within the first 10 weeks. Okay. And I want to say 10 and 11 or something like that. And it was just really interesting because it forced us to have, or didn't force us, but it prompted us to have conversations that I don't think we would have had about like, why do we want to have babies? What do we have? Mm-hmm. What do we envision for parenthood? Just all those conversations about purpose that I think you take for granted and you don't necessarily have unless you are looking down the barrel of, do we need to get some intervention? Do we need some help conceiving? And as before you want to go down that road, it's like, mm-hmm. why would we do that? Why, why mm-hmm. is this important to us? What is our, what's our whole thing there? So We had gone through that, the, we met with a a fertility specialist and they were just like, look, y'all don't have trouble getting pregnant. Y'all have trouble holding the pregnancy. It's like that Seinfeld episode. Like you can take a reservation, but it's the holding of the reservation. (laughs) And he was just like, that's a different kind of thing in terms of getting pregnant (laughs) because like we're really good at helping people get pregnant but the holding of the pregnancy is a whole different situation Mm. and he was like we just know what babies maybe there's a blood clotting issue but like it's like grasping at straws at this point Mm. and with Naomi's pregnancy there was I think I took I took some stuff for blood thinning because Years later, my OBGYN, when I moved up here, she said she was just like, I feel like a lot of the things you did were prophylactic, right? She was just like, you'd had two back-to-back miscarriages and like you needed to do something different. Like it needed to seem like you were doing something to respond to this. Mm. And so I looked at your charts and the likelihood that you had a blood clotting issue or the likelihood of whatever seems super low. Mm. And not that doctors are superstitious, but she was like, nobody would be like, it worked last time. Nobody would take you off. And so she's just, it's totally up to you what you want to do for pregnancy number two and pregnancy number three. And so every single pregnancy, we did a little less and a little less. And it was like, mm-hmm. like Naomi had to do blood thinning, like shots in my belly, I want to say for parts of the first trimester. Mm-hmm. And then I think estrogen and I just, they, he was just like, we just know that babies like a lot of hormones and babies a lot of, so we'll just see, throw a lot at the wall and see what sticks. Right. Right. And so did that with Nay. And then my, this is funny. I know you said it's not a birth story, but this is hilarious. I thought it was. So my husband was in school and he had a career fair the day before Naomi was born or the day after Naomi was born. And I was helping him kind of prep and get ready for it. So I was like researching some of the companies and like writing him like little notes on like a Google doc or whatever. Mm-hmm. And my back started hurting. I was like, so weird. And so I kneeled against the side of our bed. And every time my back hurt, I dropped to all fours mm. to relieve the pressure off my back. Cause I just yeah. thought my belly so big. 
and did that for like over an hour. <laughs> and that was labor. Who knew? <laughs> right. Which kind of lets you know a little bit about my pain tolerance. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. I'm just like, do, 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 ow, let me get on my whatever. Right. And, and so I went to the kitchen and my water broke. Oh. And I, but I wasn't sure. And so I woke my husband up and I was just like, hey, either my water broke or I peed on myself. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> and I was like, I need you to go smell it and see what's up. <laughs> he's not going to do that. And I was just like, dude, you never do anything. So I do what any grown 32 year old woman does. I call my mama. <laughs> I was like, mom, <laughs> I either peed on myself or my water broke. And she's like, your water broke. We're on our way. <laughs> So they lived like 10 minutes away at the time. So they rushed over and we all go to the hospital and they get to the hospital and the doctors, yo, he's an older man. He's been delivering babies for at least 40 years. Definitely. Like mm-hmm. I, I'm like not even exaggerating because I think he delivered one of my mom's friend's oh. children. And Dr. Tribute, shout out, he's the bomb. He was like, he met me there. And he checked me and he's like, whoa, what's up? This is, he's like, he didn't say this. I'm paraphrasing because he doesn't talk like this. But he was like, dang, your blood pressure. And I was just like, oh, am I going to die? And he was just like. That's not what you want to hear your doctor say. He, didn't say. he really didn't say that. But this is all, this is all how things are. Right. These are all how professional things are being translated in my mind. He probably right. said something like it's higher than we I'm sure he said something very professional and right. on point. And I was just all I heard was like, Dang, your blood pressure high. Ooh. And so he was like, We need to get this baby out because that's the thing that's gonna bring your blood pressure down. I was like, Cool. Uh-huh. And so they gave me Pitocin and I didn't have an epidural because I was nervous about a needle in my back. Mm. We got there about three ish. And I think I was five centimeters when I got there. And Nay was born at seven. Oh, wow. Yeah. Quick labor. Yeah. Yeah. We like, yeah. It was me and my husband and I, like, we shine in the delivery room. Like, <laughs> nurses were like, oh my gosh. I was like, I know, right? Like, we had no idea that it was in us. And that, that was like one of our places, which is why I kept being like, are we done? His question, we cannot keep just having babies for like singular moments around right. delivery. Four hours. Yeah. Well <laughs> it's just that's not wise. And I was like, you you never do anything. He was like, that is just not smart. I was like, ah. But yeah. So my births were all very quick, mm-hmm. as as comfortable as birth ever is. Mm-hmm. I had relatively small babies. So Nay was 5'15. Mm. Lydia was six three and Josh was six five. Okay. And all Pitocin, no epidural under four hours of labor in the hospital. In the hospital. And all induced in some form or fashion because of my my blood pressure. And all, so all induced meaning, so with that first birth experience, you were in labor, but then used the Pitocin to help you along once you got to the hospital. With the other two, were you also in labor once you got to the hospital or was it with with the last one yes like I was having contractions at my like 38 week appointment kind of thing Mm -hmm. with my middle one no with my middle one I went in for my 38 week checkup and they were like ah your blood pressure and I was like again Uh (laughs) and they were like can you have this baby today and I was just like let me see about my child care for the other one and so yeah that was what we did there but she that was the whole she broke my water did something to my membranes. I think it's scraped, but that sounded harsh, but I think that's what they call it. Your membrane. Yeah. Good. Sweep yeah. it? Yeah. They call it sweeping okay. the membrane. Okay. Not scraping it. <laughs> oh. I don't know. Maybe somebody. No, no, no. You're like, <laughs> maybe yours was extreme. No. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> mine were swept. I don't know what they're doing to your membranes over there. But she did that. And mm-hmm. then, and then I just, and I, for the second one, I like called my husband. I was like, hey, they're breaking my water. He's like, oh my God, I didn't tell my boss I was having a baby today. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, if it's anything like the other two, if you don't leave now, you're going to miss it. So oh, yeah. I get here. He was so okay. Funny. All right. So then tell me about the immediate postpartum experience. You have a baby. It's really yeah. fast, four hours. Yeah. And you were in two different hospital systems. So Tennessee yeah. and Connecticut. I was like, I just, and just so honored and just like 
overwhelmed by just being a part of it. You got this baby on you. You're like, what? So and did they put the baby on you immediately in all three cases? Yes. Okay. To put the baby on me. We, I was at baby friendly hospitals for all of it. Okay. So I delivered at like the women's hospital in Nashville and then at Yale, at Yale here mm-hmm. in Connecticut. And they put the baby on me, did the whole thing. And then what I remember is in Nashville, I walked to my delivery room. I walked to my recovery room. Wow. And I was just like, this is the, like, I just gave birth. <laughs> And I'm walking down the freaking hallway. Like, this is... Because I remember not too even long ago before, not too long before I gave birth, like, I just remember seeing people maybe at church or whatever who had given birth. And somehow in my head, I just was like, wow, I can't believe I see them out in the streets. What? Mm -hmm. And it's like, Mm -hmm. just amazing how quickly your body recovers from something that is just Mm -hmm. so traumatic and such a big deal. But you're designed to do like I feel like it's just amazing so I walked to my recovery room and had a really nice southern breakfast in Nay's case because she was born at 7 a.m mm-hmm. and yeah for the other ones for the other ones I knew like Lydia I felt like they were going to admit me so I got some lunch before I went <laughs> uh-huh and then Josh's was scheduled Okay. Josh's was scheduled. Yeah. So so the baby's on you. How long were the babies on you? Do you remember? Can you recall Ooh, that? Was no. it more like 20 minutes, more like an hour, more like two hours before the babies were taken away for weighing, measuring? I think they did it in the room. Uh-huh. I feel like but, they did it in the room. Yeah, they did it in the room. But how long before that? I how think long? they, so I'm going to say they... They stayed on my chest pretty long, and then I put we put them in the bassinet to wheel them down the hallway mm-hmm. for Nay for okay. the first one, and then I don't know. One of them had the last one; his blood like blood sugar was weird. Okay, so they kept coming back and pricking his little foot, mm. but I don't remember. Okay, and do yep. you remember their first their first feedings, their first latches? Yes, I relied heavily on the the nurses. I had really great nurses. I was surprised at how quickly you get comfortable with somebody else, like literally picking your breast up and putting it in somebody else's mouth. And they just all did that really well. I think it didn't, no matter how many times I had done it and I had my kids relatively close. Right. And so I had to get extra tutoring And I went to a lactation consultant or somebody from church who was like a nurse came over to our house with every single child. Mm -hmm. Like I got, I focused on figuring out the latch and figuring out our positions and all that other stuff. Hardcore. I know for the first two months of every kid, Mm -hmm. like I remember tears. I videotaped myself (laughs) with Nate. A couple mm-hmm. of times because I could not see what I was doing wrong. Mm. And I was like, this doesn't work. I remember my husband, he actually was, and like, you just sometimes can't see certain, like, I'm not necessarily spatially gifted or whatever. And it did not matter how many times somebody told me, bring your baby to your breast. I always tried to put my nipple in the baby's mouth. Like a yeah. straw. It yeah. didn't matter how many times I saw there's like a video on the pump station that I watched over and over. And it was like one for every single child. It took a couple of weeks at least for it to click. No, seriously, bring the baby to your breast, bring the baby to your breast instead Mm -hmm. of the opposite. Mm -hmm. And whenever I didn't, I would end up with this weird latch and it'd be painful, but I did not stop. I always put my finger inside of their mouth and tried again. I fortunately was not that deterred when the baby was fussy <laughs> like if the baby was crying was like oh I'm so frustrated or whatever I was just like this is what babies do I will be frustrated too but like I am the only food source so don't put pressure on yourself Gretchen just figure out how to do it I was very calm about that um yeah and I think I was only like worried because like sometimes you'll start like expressing milk while you're trying to get it because you're like mm. drop your let down and that always messed me up because I didn't have a good grip but other than that like every Cheryl came over 
she was a nurse from my church and she was a lactation consultant. She came and helped me with my latch for Lydia. Then Miss Mimico came over. She was also a lady from church. She helped me with my latch for Josh and Lydia. Mm-hmm. And they all just made sure that I got it. And I just mm-hmm. always felt, dang, I literally just did this. Like, why yeah. am I struggling? Well, it's amazing the difference between nursing a one-year-old and nursing a two-day-year-old. Yeah, like, yeah. You uh-huh. can't get how different it feels yeah, from yeah. a bigger child to a, a an itty-bitty baby. baby. And each baby yeah. is different. Their anatomy mm-hmm. is different. Their mouth is different. Yeah. They're learning, too. Yep. So you said you got support in the hospital. Do you remember the days that your milk, that your mature milk came in, like when it switched from colostrum to? I have, a, so I have a journal. I could probably find it, but I kept the little journals that they gave us from the pediatrician's office, as well as like a milk log to try to see you know, like what side I nursed from and stuff like that until we got into a good rhythm. Yeah. But I would say, I want to say four or five days, maybe. Four or five days Does for each of them. Does that sound right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's within. Maybe four or five days. Yeah, that sounds about right. And it was funny because I never felt like, probably my diet, I don't remember, but I remember <laughs> my one of my managers, she had a baby at the same time as I did with Naomi. And I traveled a lot for work. Like I traveled a lot and that was one of the other reasons why I was so excited and just so in love with nursing is because I was constantly on the plane with a newborn Mm. and I saw people's eyes like when I got on and I just was like, don't worry, I'm nursing. Literally like every time I got off a plane, people were like, oh my gosh, I didn't Mm. even know a baby was on the plane. I was like, ah, which I don't know if that's like a compliment. They they meant it as a compliment, but it's like whatever but it was be I never felt scared Mm -hmm. I never felt oh this baby's gonna be fussy and I there's nothing I can do because we were nursing so Mm -hmm. I was nursing but I remember with my manager she had a baby and we were both pumping and she put hers in the refrigerator and I looked at hers I was like what her milk looked like vitamin d whole milk and Mm -hmm. mine looked like skim next to hers Mm -hmm. and she saw me looking at her she said "Uh uh-uh Gretchen don't be trying to take my milk (laughs) I was like, nobody want to want your milk. What are you talking about? Like, I don't. I would, that's so. Why would I even want that? But I totally did. Yeah, well, Our kids are gonna grow up so big and strong. <laughs> yeah, just a different composition. But yeah, so, yeah. At least at those times of the day, you know. Right. She's I was killing it. I was yeah. like, that is amazing. But mm-hmm. I pumped a lot. I pumped from the beginning too. Like I was. I had a friend. Our babies are one day apart, but she had twin boys. Mm. And I remember Jesse, she had a whole nother storage of milk. And I, it's like how I, when I first started teaching, it was like, oh, I want to have files. I want to have institutional knowledge about such and such. That's how I approached like nursing. I was like, I want to have files. I want to have so mm. much frozen milk. But yeah, because I knew I was going to be traveling too. So I wanted to make sure that when I was gone, like my husband was set. My yeah. Was set. Yeah. You said your milk came in around day four or five. And were you already home at that time? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And did you, did your babies lose weight at all from birth weight? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All of them lost like some ounces. Okay. But nothing severe. Okay. And was that stressful at all? Or you just knew to expect that and... Just- I, I didn't know to expect it. Nay was 5'15", so she was tiny. Yeah. Com- I, I thought she was tiny. And so I was just like, wow, this baby's really small. But I wasn't worried. Okay. I wasn't worried. And did anyone else, was there anyone, your pediatrician or family doctor, was anybody else worried or everybody just was supporting what you were doing? Yeah, everybody was supporting. She looked, and I think it's just so interesting because th- I've thought about this maybe since she's a girl. And so she's, I feel like it's like a piece of it. She just looked like a tiny little doll. Mm-hmm. That's what people just used to say all the time. Oh my gosh, she looks like a doll. She looks like a doll. And so I was just wondering if she had been, she was, my husband's a smaller frame and then my family's petite. And so she was always a petite. All of my kids, Josh was 
like on the regular, like the average kind of growth curve. But my girls are petite. I think they're mm-hmm. projected to be like five four and five five. And so I think they just saw her as like this like petite little baby. And nobody ever said anything. Okay. So no one was worried about the growth mm-hmm. curve. All mm-hmm. right. And and how did you know in those early days, like before your milk came in, mm-hmm. that you were your babies are still getting milk. It's just colostrum. It's that early milk. How did you know that they were taking in milk and swallowing some amount of milk as you were waiting for that big, for your mature milk to come in? I was Remember? really comforted by like what I had heard, like the science of like their bellies are the size of a nickel or a penny or whatever, right? Yeah. And yeah. so that little bit that you gave them filled them up. I was mm-hmm. like, bet. Like I am definitely one of not looking for problems. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, that's what you told me. That's what I believe. Cool, cool. Mm-hmm. And unless there's another, unless there's a problem, like I'm going to assume that everything's all good. And then when I, then when it came in and I wasn't sure because my latches weren't consistent, then that's when I went to the lactation consultant and they did the way before mm-hmm. and they did the way after of the feeding. And then that's how I benchmarked it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And when they did those weighted feeds, that helped you just in between time to know, okay, yeah, we're good. I can tell from this pinpoint in time. I think once I just assumed, like I said, I feel like that one of the themes of like my whole journey is that I don't have to know, I don't have to understand everything my body was designed for this. Like it was designed for this baby. Like I, like it's like the mystery of it all, even though there's Mm -hmm. science to it, but the mystery Mm -hmm. of it all just is what got me. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't worry about the milk as much once I got my latch good. Okay. I was like, once I'm latched, once she's latched and it's not painful, Mm -hmm. then if I'm feeding at will, we're good to go. Yeah. And so then I didn't sweat any of the details around that. It was just like anytime she wanted to eat or he wanted to eat, then I fed. So that's yeah. how I did it. Yeah. Now, Gretchen, you and I have talked a lot over the years about inequities that exist within education where you and I, you and I have been involved in the education se- sector and we know they exist within the birth world (laughs) and the support that Black women receive in the United States when it comes to both birth and lactation is is documented as being different and subpar Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) than what their middle class and rich white counterparts receive Mm -hmm. and even not rich and middle class. So I'm just wondering if you sought out care providers that you knew were going to listen to you and, and make sure that they took you seriously when you were making choices about feeding your babies or if, or if that just fell into place based on where you were in Nashville with Naomi. And then how did that work out for you as far as making sure that when you were seeking out care providers who listened to you and who were aligned with your goals as a black woman in the United States, did you encounter any of those inequities or not, or not feeling listened to, or did you feel like for you, that yeah. wasn't, that, that didn't, that wasn't a part of your experience? That wasn't a part of my experience. So my other best friend from high school is an OBGYN. And so she's a black woman. So I feel like <laughs> Earlier on in the pregnancy and just in general, I would always, I'd always not save my, I was like, I'll save my crazy for you. But I just asked like her anything. I also felt very safe. My doctor was an older white man, Mm -hmm. um, very old school, like very. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Some of my girlfriends were like, how did you, how? And I was just like, I don't mind him. I think he's great. And I trust him. I felt I didn't ever feel like he wasn't listening to me when his daughter, like when I lost one of the babies and I had had to, when we went to, to go to the checkup and there was no heartbeat for the ultrasound, like his, he and his daughter, like held my hand and wept with me and prayed with me. You know what I'm saying? And so it was I just, I trusted them and cared for them. And I felt like they care for me. Um, okay. And then 
in terms of nursing, like I said, I always had people from our church community or like church community definitely because those were the nurses that came over to our house after I delivered yeah. and gave me like one-on-one sessions. <laughs> you sought out people within your community yeah. that you already trusted. Who were, and yeah, who were, yeah, yeah, and who were, that was their job. Yeah. So I was just like, yo, like, I'm having trouble. This is not working. Mm-hmm. And they were like, I'll watch you. Let's try. And time again, they were like, quit <laughs> trying to not bring your baby to your breast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I didn't experience that. And like I said, I also had access to being able to go to a lactation consultant. I also right. had a job that I was working from home right. eight years ago. So like I could go to the lactation, exactly. but then the first, was I working in a school? I had just transitioned from working in a school though, but I am also, even when I was working in an office and you were there, like I am, I got more so even as I, towards the end of having my, all my children, but like I am militant about taking my, taking what is offered to me or mm-hmm. do me. So mm-hmm. they're like, you can have as many breaks as you want to pump, bet. But if we're having a meeting, like right. I'm sitting there, if we're having a meeting in the office and I didn't even ask for permission, I always asked, I always, I definitely took a apologize or what's the phrase? Don't ask for permission, ask for, yeah. I always mm-hmm. took that route. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. We, this isn't bring your child to work day. I didn't know. <laughs> I thought we, you said we we're having a five hour step back in the office and y'all know my baby's at home me most of the time. So I just assumed that y'all knew that I would be bringing them. Sorry. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know, we're sitting at this table for a long time. I'm nursing my kid here. I can put a cover up or y'all can see my whole boob. I don't care. Mm. And so I'm, I was, but I've never, I wasn't even in work settings where that was like, people were like, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. And I actually think I was a bit of a trailblazer, honestly, because I think some moms saw me doing it and they were mm-hmm. like, Nobody said anything to her. Cool. I'll do it too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. And I know you can't speak for everyone's experience, but you can speak for what it felt like for you. A hundred percent. Yeah. Did it change at all once you were in Connecticut or it felt pretty much the same? Pretty much the same. Okay. Pretty much the same. Yeah. Awesome. And then you taught, you mentioned a little bit about how there was some pain in the beginning for yeah. you. How yeah. long did it take before that got resolved for uh, each of the kids? It wasn't, it was nothing that was long enough to, I feel like there was one time when I had to like give one breast a, a rest, mm. but I was just like, I had too many bad latches mm-hmm. and it was pinched. Is this kind with, of my, like, with Naomi, your first? I don't even remember. Okay. I don't remember. I feel like it was a second one. I feel like it was Lydia because I feel like I was up here, but I still pumped off that side. I just didn't nurse off that side. Okay. Because I was like militant about keeping my supply up and, but I didn't, yeah, I, there was, I have friends who nursed through pain. I never did. Uh Uh-huh. You do. I have a friend who nursed (laughs) through pain and I was like, huh? I'm like, yeah. (laughs) I never did. I yeah. if it was if they latched on and it hurt, I took them yeah. off and I tried again until it was more comfortable and yeah. you know that, maybe mild discomfort possibly, but never like Jesus take the wheel, never pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how long did it take for you and for every person this is different, but for how yeah. long did it take for you before breastfeeding just felt normal? It just mm-hmm. felt like that's how you mother. Yeah. I mean, it was normal period, right? It was just like, Mm -hmm. this is what we, this is what we're going to do. Cause that was my vision all along. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I just felt like it was just the most special thing. Mm -hmm. Like it was like, wow. And it was like opportunity to stop and just focus on this little person and just talk to them. And it was very relaxing. I just, I just really loved everything about it. Mm -hmm. That was in addition to like, wanting to keep having I definitely could see those people who have a whole bunch of kids I think Mm -hmm. there's just something very amazing about that oh sorry Lo sorry the bus driver's here oh that's fine hold on and so how long did it take before breastfeeding really felt like a normal part of your life yeah 
I think it felt normal from the beginning because it was just always a part of my vision and what I wanted. I think that after that newborn phase, so I think it's probably different, like four weeks, six weeks where they've grown a little bit, their mouth has grown. <laughs> they're a little bit more secure in your hand. They're not quite so tiny. Once they're a little bit bigger, then that makes it, that made it easier for me. Mm. And then I would say from three months on, it was not even thought. Okay. Yeah. So not even second guessing. Oh, no. Three months yeah. on, we were good to go. Yeah. 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 And what I know you mentioned nursing at work. So you had, you just nursed everywhere. Nursed yeah. at church, nursed at work. Everywhere. Did you ever get any negative feedback anywhere? Okay. Nope. Yeah. You just took your space and made it clear that's what you were doing. And I felt like it was like, I don't know. I felt like it was like, I didn't, I, yeah, I never saw anybody who was like, oh my gosh. Oh, I definitely no. remember one time on a plane, I was going to nurse Naomi. And it was the first time I was going to try to use a cover mm. over her. And I just assumed it would be okay. <laughs> and she played with that thing so hard. We were on yeah. a plane. And I was seated next to a 16-year-old boy. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I see his mom was across the aisle. Uh-huh. And I just kind of looked at her like, your son's definitely going to see my breast. <laughs> right. there's, there's nothing I can do. Naomi was so confused. She's like, what is this? I was trying to, because normally I hadn't used it. But You're I was like, trying to. like, fine. <laughs> yeah, I ne- yeah, I never thought. I was like, oh, this, it'll be like a tent. Uh-huh. <laughs> she didn't care for it at all. Yeah. But yeah, I just felt like they knew I was feeding a child. So that was okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so you had it in mind to, before I ask that, I actually have a question because you traveled a ton for work and you've talked about taking the baby with you. Yep. Did you always do that? Or were there times when you left baby at home? I mean, when you did that, how did you transport milk? Uh, I pumped, so I had the I had a pump and the backpack kind, and then I just carried ice like the chilled things and put them in like the hotel refrigerator. Uh huh. And then just kept it. I didn't pump a lot, and I wasn't uh-huh. gone for like weeks at a time. Uh huh. And then I had milk frozen at home, so that was all good. Okay. And for I was traveling, so I had moved to Connecticut, but I was doing a lot of work back in Nashville, so I was traveling back home, if you will. Okay. And so it was easy for me to travel with Naomi because like my mom was there when I, when I was getting to where I was going. You know? Okay. So you had your mom helping. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then anytime I traveled after that, like I always was going somewhere where somebody was going to watch a baby. Okay. Or okay. somebody could fly with me, but that was like twice maybe. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so you would just, when you were traveling back home with milk- mm-hmm. It would just be in a cooler, some sort of cooler with ice. Hope, hopefully, right? <laughs> hopefully. Yeah. It was just like in a bag. And I wasn't traveling for more than two hours. Uh-huh. So I was like, yeah. it should be good. Yeah. We're and good. it usually is. Eight yeah. hours in temperature. It's usually fine. Yeah, I'm like, we're good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so then you had it in mind to feed for a year. That was mm-hmm. your goal. So yeah. tell me about what, it, as you started to introduce solids, what was that like? And then what was it like once you started to wean your kids? Uh, we introduced solids, like, for, I don't even remember, like maybe six, whenever, I don't even remember when you're supposed, like supposed to quote unquote, but I think we probably did it pretty early for the first, cause we were just curious what's going on. Weaning became a function of teeth for me. And then also, I personally have an aversion towards a child asking for my breast. (laughs) So we're a very talkative family. And I was Uh just like, if you can ask, and then mama, I want to nurse now, then you need to get yourself, you need to handle your own food situation. And so they all, my kids started walking around like 11 months. Uh Uh-huh. Didn't. Yeah, nine, no, Nay started walking about nine months. So she started moving around nine, 10 months. And then about that time, we started like looking at each other like sideways, like our time is coming to an end, my girl. 
because you think you're grown and I'm not like a sippy cup. And we had been already using those miracle cups. And so it was just very natural. One day it just didn't happen. And I was just like, huh, she's busy. Yeah. And for the last one, (laughs) I had not nursed for two weeks and then I had a flight with him. Uh And I was just like, I was nervous because he was almost one and he was like really fidgety. And I was trying to like, I was like, I wonder if I could nurse him just to settle him down. Uh And he just looked at me like, what you doing? Uh (laughs) I was just like, would you like to? (laughs) (laughs) And he was just kind of like, yes. It was the weirdest thing. And like, I was so self-conscious at that point because he, I felt like Josh was huge at that point. So I was like grown man, Uh not really a grown man. He was less than one but I just felt like he was big yeah and he was yeah. talking he was like babbling a lot so I was just like yeah this is against but that was after that time that was our last time because I was just yeah. like I don't feel even comfortable <laughs> like I feel yeah. weird. it's funny how people have different sensibilities about that he was yeah, just he I feel like at that point he could have been like he literally could have just been like mama for real if he had said that I would have been like you're right like he could have just said that and I was right like, <laughs> <laughs> For real? Is this what we doing, my girl? And I'm like, yeah. you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't have tried to manipulate you into being quiet on this flight. <laughs> so oh, weird. That's so good. So funny. All of these experiences, I think, are so helpful. I think it's so good to hear the range. I a podcast that just got released today. She breastfed her child until they were five. And then to hear somebody else say, once the teeth happens, it's done for me. I think it's so important. The whole point of the milk making minutes is for people to feel that they can make the decisions that are right for them mm-hmm. and that they're that breastfeeding can fit into their lives yeah. and work for their family. And it doesn't have to be a one size fits all approach. And so I love hearing the variety of stories that I'm getting. And I love the idea of you and Josh sitting there. Wow, this is weird. (laughs) (laughs) Like, (laughs) girl, stop. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) So as we wrap up here, can you think of just a favorite memory or a favorite sensation when it comes to feeding your babies that you'll hold with you when you're an old lady in the nursing home (laughs) and you're thinking about those times. Do you hold those memories? Do you? I don't know if I hold a memory, but I do hold. And like I said, I think it's one of the reasons why I never consider, I taught elementary, upper elementary. Mm -hmm. And so I never consider myself like a baby person. Mm -hmm. But I just hold feeling very powerful and very capable and just very important Mm -hmm. for a long time in a way that like was very special. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, this matters and it's a sacrifice, but it's also very joyful. And I feel Mm -hmm. like that is just what sums up parenting for me. I felt like breastfeeding was like one of my first kind of hurdles as like a as a mom, do you really get that this is not about you anymore? Mm -hmm. Do you really get that like, you're going to have to talk to lactation consultants and do you get this? And I was like, I do, I do. And then Mm -hmm. it was like, as I made those sacrifices and as I pursued this vision of what I thought was best for me and my kid, it was a sacrifice, but it was also very joyful. Mm -hmm. And I just am I'm very passionate about like supporting new moms. Like one of my neighbors was having trouble nursing her and she called and I went over there and it was just like so nice to be able to like help her get Mm -hmm. her latch together and hold her Mm -hmm. baby while she took a shower. Like all Mm -hmm. the things that like moms do for each other. It's just a very special time. One that I do not take for granted. And I hope I can help as many people find like joy and balance as they try to nurse as I can. Yeah, that's amazing. And then finally, where can people find you? What are you up to? Oh, so I started an organization called Co-Teach, and we support families with at-home learning and partnering with educators and community members and folks who are just helping them uh, help their child, (laughs) help them educate their child, help them nurture their child holistically as a learner. And so you can find me at Co-Teach. Like we are co-teaching our children, co-teach.org. And yeah. 
Great. Awesome. My millions of listeners will flock to co-teach <laughs> because you're amazing at it. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. This has been so fun. Awesome. It has been. Thanks, Gretchen. Thank you, love. If this conversation was exactly what you needed in your life, please let me know by joining the Milk Making Minutes community group on Facebook and just telling me there. Gretchen really knows how to calm a person's nerves and help them feel like, yeah, I've got this. I can do it no matter what situation you're facing. So if you would like to reach out to her for services regarding your child's education, I highly recommend you check out CoTeach. It's a really great organization. She works a lot with both individual families and with entire school districts because they have seen what a difference she can make. And if you are somebody who thinks, you know what, I need a little bit of extra help navigating questions around feeding my child, I would love to be that support for you. So you can find all of my information at www.quabinbirthservices.com.